and what they will what they will say is they won't let you go until you've had two clear bowel movements. So they'll leave you there so you can have but two shits. The toilet's shit. not clear; it's metal. I know, but they'll leave you there until you have two shits. But how how are you going to see that? Oh, that you're on constant watch. So when you done poo poos, yeah, someone comes in and checks it. Yeah, yeah. Nah, you're having a laugh. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, today we are providing information guidance from the one and only Brown Lawyer from Instagram. If you're not following, you need to get to following because you never know when you can get in trouble with the popo. The law is out there. Some will say to be broken, but this man has come today. He's going to show you how to stick to the law, aren't you? Welcome, Kibla. Uh, thank you very much. Well, I'll, I'll try. So you are a defence solicitor. Yeah, I was going to. I was going to say the my role is to try and get you off of trouble. Right. So you're what the man them need. Yeah. So when they get in trouble, and I say they, I'm going to say they as in, let's use man them on the roads. Yeah. That might be dealing, doing a little bit uh, 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 side <coughs> business. When they get nabbed, they call you. Ideally, yeah. And even though you know that they're guilty. No. <laughs> how do you mean no. no? That's not how we work. That's okay, not, so how do you not, work then? That's not how we roll. So it's part of the whole ethics of how we do law. So a lot of a lot of the time, people confuse us with America. Okay. So American lawyers, you tell your lawyer, "Mate, I did it." Yeah. And your lawyer will still go in there and talk rubbish on your behalf. Right. Ours is all on based on instructions. Oh. So if you ever said to me, "Kib, I've done it, but I'm going to say this," uh, uh-uh, uh, not working. Really. I'll, I'll either withdraw. Or I'll say to you, the only way to run your defense is for me to test the prosecution evidence. And I wouldn't advance a positive case. I wouldn't certainly wouldn't let you give evidence. Serious. Because mm-hmm. so, I think I watch too many American programs. I think so. Because I, you know, CSI and that. And what's the other one? Law and Order. I like those programs and I can binge watch. And I'm sure they tell their solicitor everything. But you've got confidence, like lawyer privileges, confidentiality. But you're saying UK, it don't work. No. So you go to any lawyer you'll go to, you have to go, you have to give your instructions in relation to what you want to do in that case. You can't be saying, oh, X happened, but I'm going to say Y. Mm. So technically you represent the bad guys. Alleged bad guys. Alleged. And is it innocent until proven guilty? Absolutely. One of the maxims that we always stick by, and it's something that's sometimes forgotten, is you're innocent until proven guilty. It's the, it's the Crown's job, Crown, CPS, whoever you want to call it, Regina, the Queen, Liz. Um, Regina? Regina is another name for Liz. Oh, is it? The Crown, yeah. Oh, didn't know that. Yeah, so Liz, <laughs> basically Liz prosecutes all of us. Right. Because you can go into Her Majesty's palace or pr- prison. 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 H- H-M-B. <laughs> Not the palace. <laughs> Okay. I'm pretty sure people will be committing crime to get into that palace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my problem is, at the moment, is that you go to some solicitors and they have no idea of what's going on. And you and I have known each other for several years and I've known that you've grown up on a big estate in Camden. So you have rubbed shoulders with some of the least uh, popular members of society. So part of your strength is that you know really what happens. Well, absolutely. I think part of the strength of coming from the background i do is we've lived it we've breathed it we've seen it yeah and it, it's it's there every day on our doorsteps like you know like in my case i've represented seven doors to my left wow about 12 doors to my right Jeez. my mom still lives there <laughs> so it's close to home yeah absolutely which puts on more pressure it must there. do so 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 you were like the estate solicitor well yeah part of the reason why i i kind of moved was because I was coming home every evening. And I don't mind this. Because my phone, as you know, yeah. my phone is on 24-7. doesn't matter what time, WhatsApp, messages, calls, whatever. But I was coming home and I was getting adv- asked advice as I was coming up the steps. People were knocking on the door. 
Wait, 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 wait. You're supposed to pay for advice. Because I know I've been to solicitor and her clock started the minute I got through that door. <laughs> but you're out here on the estate giving advice. See, that it's more about where I'm from. So I've seen these guys grow up. Well, I see certainly my age group grow up mm. where they didn't have advice. Yeah. Didn't have somebody to go to. And I'm a legal aid lawyer at the end of the day. I do do private work. Yeah. But there's no difference between the private work I provide and the legal aid work I provide because that that's a that's a fuckery. I wouldn't What's do. What's your success rate? Well, success rate is very difficult to say. Like no solicitor will ever tell you this is our success rate because ultimately <laughs> each case turns on its own fact. Okay. And you could come to me say, "Oh, Kib, I got this case," and you're bang to rights. The most I'm going to do for you is try to get the best possible result. So okay. the way so the way to describe it is you don't necessarily defend you represent right the client and when you say give instruction what if i don't know the instruction to give that because that's for me i have no idea about the law if i've done a crime and i say to you i need representation you ask me what's my instructions i don't know just set me free like let me get on bail or what is it remand is it remand no remand's in prison isn't it remand is when you're in prison and i don't want to go on remand that's what i'm going to tell you yeah. i don't want to go on remand I want my bell to be fifty pound. Is that a good instruction? No, you're watching too many American movies. <laughs> I don't know. And then you have to go to the bondsman. Do you have to go to the bondsman? No, nah, but that's America. Stop it. So what do you have to Behave. do? So if I got arrested, what do I have to do? So the first thing when you're arrested <clears throat> is don't say anything. Do not say anything. So no comment. Is yeah, just no comment or just stay silent because the first thing the officers will do, they will arrest you. They arrest you and they'll read you out the caution. As right. soon as you're, that caution is put to you. Don't say anything. Don't say anything until you've got you've obtained legal advice. And that's with everything. Everything. But what I tend to find is people start yapping. People start <laughs> talking like it's nobody's business. They start singing like a bloody canary. So when you come in, you've got to fix all of the well, there's a hard, Sometimes it's hard to fix. Damage is already done. Yeah. Because they're singing like a, like a canary. Like the way I see it, the way the law is, is that it's the, the police case or the crown case to prove the case against you. Right. You don't have to prove anything. Right. But well, people start asking questions. They don't get law lawyers. Then people start giving their phones out, start giving the pin codes for the phone. They start. But what if the police say, I'm seizing this phone under section, blah, blah, blah. I'm feeling pressured. I'm going to give them my phone. Nah, they could take the phone. They may be able to take the phone in, in certain circumstances. On a stop and, stop and search, they shouldn't be. Right. Okay. So let's talk about stop and search because as... A black woman that knows many black men. I'm not saying white men don't get stop and search, but we have a higher proportion of stop and search that are not necessarily called for or lawful. What shall we do if if I'm a if I've got a younger brother, 25, 21, and he gets stopped by the police and he's been asked to search? What are they going to say to him? So the police have a code that they need to go by, uh, and the, the, it's called the pace codes that they're governed by. But in terms of trying to break it down so viewers and say, you know, the 15 year old might be watching this or whoever, even the at the adult understands it. When it says stop and search, they have to go something by which is called go wisely. Right. So it's abbreviations. So just so I make sure that I'm giving you the right context. Yeah. So G, they first have to give you the grounds of the search. This is the police officer. This is the police officer. So they have to give the grounds of the search. Can they handcuff me in that time? They will get there. Okay. So they need to give the grounds of the search. Then they need to say the object of the search, which is the O. So what they're searching for. Right. So whether it's because you've been alleged to meet a description of somebody in the area or there's uh, searching for weapons or searching for drugs, they need to say what it is, right. what they're searching for. Then the W comes along. They have to show you what their warrant card, identify who they are. So that's like an ID badge. Yep. Right. Yep. When they're not in uniform. But if they're in uniform... If they're in full uniform, of course. Right. You know, it's quite obvious they're a police officer. Then the identity. So part of the warrant card is the identity. They need to say who they are. So officer Joe Bloggs, number XXX, X, X, well, whatever it is. Yeah. And then say who it is. There's certain exceptions I won't go into because that was all related to terrorism and stuff like that. Okay. And I'd be here for hours explaining that. Then you've got station, which station they're attached to. Okay. Uh, then you've got the... They have to explain to you that you've got an entitlement or a copy of the form for the search. Do you think many people know they have an entitlement to the copy no. of the search? When I've gone to youth clubs, as you and I did for many, many years, schools, even when you go to adults, either they don't know or they just can't be bothered to ask for it. And why is it important to get that? Say you're stopped three or four times. 
Yeah. If you've got a search form for every single time you've been searched and it's baseless, then essentially you can go to the ombudsman or to the inspector in the area and right. say, look, this is harassment. And I tell right. my clients all the time, anybody who comes to me, if, if you get a record of the stop and search and you show that there's a pattern here, we all know there's institutional racism around. We know that black and ethnic minorities are stopped more regularly than our Caucasian counterparts. But in order for you to, part of the whole uh, route, if you will, to get justice or to pull people to account, yeah. is you need to have some evidence behind you. Right. If you start saying, oh, I stopped on Monday yeah, yeah. and I stopped on Tuesday, you start end up in a Craig David song with no evidence. So it's like, it's like a receipt, basically. Basically, yeah. Because you can't go to the shop and... and Talk about poor service if you've got no evidence that you've been there. Absolutely. So be, they will say, they will come back to you. So when were you searched? And the thing is, is then you have the identity of the officer because that's that form will have all those details on. Right. Which brings me to the next bit. So then they have to, a part of why they're searching, they have to give you the legal authority. So the, um, so the power they're exercising. So, right. so for example, a one that is routinely used is Section 23 of the Misuse of Drugs Act when they want to search for drugs. But they need to tell you that. But do you not have grounds to have to search for that? Absolutely. So just my man on the road with his black <clears throat> tracksuit hood up, is that enough to warrant a search under Section 23? So there's there's your grey area. So when the officers come, they, they're given guidance in relation to what reasonable circumstances are. And a lot of them... That's stereotyping, right? I know, of course. But let's be honest. People make it up as they go along. Or they just... Which is why the... The record is important yeah. because they will detail all, everything that's happened. So if you pull them to account, we were saying, well, why did you search this man on, on this occasion? So what if they say, you're not getting it? Well, they, this is the difficulty. When you're not, they're not giving it, always look out for the, for the shoulder number, especially in their uniform. Right. They've got the, the number across the, across the shoulder. So you can say on this occasion, this is what's happened. So I see a lot of people, when other people are getting arrested, filming. Yeah. Is that... A done thing could you be yourself arrested for that are you allowed to film you are allowed to film so there's no law against no filming law against someone it. else okay so what if i am the person being stopped and searched can i or being held by the police can i film or not potentially i mean <clears throat> you get into difficulties with officers but in theory you have no there should be no objections to it because the officer has got body worn video right here but is that on it's up to them when they turn it on what kind of foolishness? <laughs> so, what's the point of having a body worn if it's not? Auto it should be automatically on, right? It should be automatically on, especially when you, when you, when you're going to arrest someone or something of that nature. But a lot of people won't, when they're routinely searching, may not turn it on. I don't want to tarnish everybody with the yeah, same yeah, brush, yeah. of course. But there's certain occasions where I found within my practice where the body worn video would have been very useful, mm. and the officers, oh no, it wasn't on. Very handy, right? But I mean, in, in terms of your answer to your question, there's, I would, if it was me, I say, officer, I completely understand, but for my own protection and for my own information, I'm just going to record this. Right. And so what I've noticed now on a lot of like our urban radio stations, they're making this big campaign to get police officers that are black, brown, gay, whatever. Do you think that's going to help the minority community by having us represented? Because... I'm thinking of George Floyd, for example. Yeah. There was a black officer right there when the white officer had his knee on his neck. Yeah. Didn't say anything, didn't do anything. There was an oriental man right there, said nothing, did nothing. What's your thoughts of making the police team more multicultural? I think it's a positive. The reason why I say that is because I think with experience... Um, of those different minority groups, you have a way in which they will deal with you. Okay. So you might have somebody, one of our friends, for instance, may have grown up on a council estate, now a police officer. He knows how to talk to them. Mm. He knows, <clears throat> I'm not going to do this because I know this is discrimination. This happened to me when I was younger and I'm going to make sure that the police is about what it's supposed to be. Right. And I'm not going to discriminate. So I think in that way, it's, it's very positive. I but, guess so. But at the same time, I, sh I share the... 
cynicism. Yeah. I share I'm it. dubious. No, I no, really no. I, am. No, no, no. I share it because sometimes you're thinking, well, what are you going to do that's different? But the hope is that, you know, these p- people who come into the pr- to, to the profession with their different experiences and, you know, the backgrounds and all the rest of it, that they will bring a, a more kind of rounded... But what I've noticed is sometimes they take a position of... Least resistance? Yeah, and they don't want to look pally pally and, you know, it's one of yours, so I'm not going to show favouritism because it's a black boy and I'm a black man. And that irritates me even more. Mm. Because I'm like, as you said, I would hope you'd get into (coughs) it to make a difference instead of just being a flower on the wall. Well, the Floyd Floyd, um, example. Well, that that was typical where somebody probably knew in his head, but that shouldn't be happening. But because of the numbers... But even the white officer that wasn't, that I didn't have his knee on, he probably knew right from wrong also. But I guess sometimes we're in... I think one of the white officers told him to ease off. Oh, did he? I think one of them did tell him to ease off. Do you see what I mean? But he doesn't feel any way about saying that because he's saying it to another white man. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whereas a black man says it, be like, oh, what? Because he's your brother. (laughs) Like, yeah. You know what the insinuation is? It's a lot. So So they fear that because they were like... You can imagine the conversation that happens afterwards. Say he, in, in, well, A, he probably saves, he definitely saves a life. Yeah. But then he goes back, he's like, oh, you know, look at this guy, you know, he's come onto the force and he's done this. But but let's put that all aside with one big caveat. Yeah. The Americans roll differently. Yeah, they do. And I think we are quite fortunate in the UK that there is, a, I think, a different level of force used by officers. Well, firstly, that we're not allowed to carry guns routinely. Oh, but we're not. <laughs> no. I uh, thought the Pope wanted. No, only special officers with special training um, and signing off hold firearms. Wow. But most they have, all officers usually have, you know, you obviously see. A little taser. Yeah. So what the, the Why most. Why is a taser illegal? Because my sister wants to send me a taser. Oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but like I'm a woman on the streets. And in America, you can have tasers, you can have pepper spray you can have the whole thing why can't i and i talk about that because we've got people like sabrina nessa and sarah everard Mm -hmm. that have been harmed imagine if they had a defense on their possession that they could have used why are we not prioritized like the american women then well this is a problem america have different laws in terms of guns weapons all the rest of it It, it's a complete different kettle of fish over there Mm. I'm very grateful that the, 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 the UK is the way it is. You, what? You don't want me to have a taser on these no, roads? No, no. Out on these streets? No, but here's what it is. So where you, it's like a Pandora's box. So if you open it up, everybody's holding them. I hear that. But things like, let's use Amsterdam as an example. Cannabis is legal. Mm-hmm. You don't see a drug-related crime problem in Amsterdam. You do. Oh, okay. With the class A. <laughs> All right, the class A, but not the class... B. But then it just pushes the problem into something else. But now we've got everything. We've got a class A to C problem. Yeah, we've got drug. We, we've got a drugs problem. Of course it is, and obviously there's lots of things in the in the media, in the press, everything about cannabis and you know it, legalizing it. But one thing's for sure, class A is bad. Yeah. If you've ever seen a drug addict, yeah, it is horrible. Mental, it? it is horrible. I've seen people go from fantastic careers, mm. family, uh, and to to absolute desolation just yeah. you know you can just see the face the health everything it's but horrible. some people use cannabis for medicinal purposes but yet they're penalized are there laws to protect those that do need cannabis for medicinal purposes well obviously we, what we saw recently was um a caveat where the secretary of state can authorize um drug because there was a, a, a quite i can't remember the name of it but there was quite a um, a media worthy case where they were they needed it for for medical purposes, but the law is absolute. So you have to go to what the Secretary of State. Yeah, and there's there's certain exceptions where they can authorize it. But there's a, there's millions of people that have medical conditions that are known to be aided. Absolutely, no, I'm not I'm not disputing that. But the the law as it currently is is absolute in terms of. Cannabis is illegal. I mean, they usually deal with it. I mean, p- police officers usually on your first, if you're your first stop and you're found with cannabis, they'll usually give you a cannabis warning. They won't okay. even t- do anything. So what's a cannabis warning? Cannabis warning is just something that's recorded on the police records. 
it's inform it's pretty much informal, but it just shows that you've been stopped for it before and you've got you've had a warning for it. So in or a one ticket. Of, in one of these stop and search incidences, and if I was this young woman or young man and I have some weed in a little I don't know what a is it a grinder or a little Don't pretend you don't know what it is. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. I don't smoke the stuff and I know what it is. <laughs> I got it in a little cling film, yeah? Uh-huh. Because I need it just to calm me down because i got ADHD and it just relaxes my soul, okay? Mm. Don't judge me. What if I'm caught with that for the second time? For the second time, if the officers show that you've got, you've had uh, a previous cannabis warning, I mean, it depends on all of the, on the officer. Mm. Some officers will look at it and think, listen, you're an idiot. We'll take it off you, throw it in the in the gutter or whatever and just tell you to be on your way. Okay. But the letter of the law says you stop once, cannabis warning. You stopped again, caution. Right. Small amount so you can get a police caution, which stays on your record. Um, so if I go for a job, it's on there? Well, it's not disclosable. It's spent. Oh. As soon as, a, as, soon as the caution is given, it's spent. So, so you don't have to wait five years? No, no, no. That's all oh, changed. Okay. There's, there's, there's massive changes in terms of... Because they, there was a big kind of push because it was alienating people with criminal convictions and cautions in terms of getting what? jobs and, yeah. and moving on in society. Um, so a lot of it has reduced. Um, right. If anybody's interested, .gov.uk will, will show it to you, give you the new kind of um, okay. time frame. Right. But then second time's a caution. Third time, they'll charge you. That you're and, and if I'm charged, am I taken into custody? Realistically, no. A lot of officers right now, when you're caught with a bit of cannabis, they'll be like, they'll they'll probably do a little interview right there on the spot. Really, take the cannabis off you, and then they'll they usually put a you get receive a charge in the post. So say this cannabis thing is my side hustle now. Let's up it a notch. Okay, right, and got bills to pay, and so I just sell a little bit, you know, just a little bit, not no big bit, just a little bit. I got like. Maybe 10 wraps on me. Yeah. What are they going to do? Okay, well, straight away. Well, the thing is, 10 wraps. I mean, I don't know if I'm going to get vilified for saying this, but 10 wraps. If there's nothing else around, remember, the Crown have to prove their case. Right. So if it's 10 wraps, I've had, I've had people with 16 wraps, 17, 18, 20 wraps, who have just been done for just possession. Okay. Because there's no evidence to show... Possession of what? Class B. Class B. Right. But the problem... Because the, I could use that for personal use, right? Yeah. Okay. If there's, right. no, if there's no other evidence showing supply. Remember, you don't have to prove anything. They have to show it. Right. However, what you run the risk is when you have drugs separated out like that. Mm. Because usually... The, the intent to supply. Ab- absolutely. Because usually the inference is, if it's your personal use, you usually just get it in one lump but of course many people will say that i'm i i need it because what i'd like to do is i like to divvy it up during the day absolutely (laughs) i like to separate it out make sure that the deal is not bumping me and i like to even out the use and i've just purchased it or they've given me a a a discount i've gone to buy a little bit they said well if you buy a couple (laughs) one that's the only way the dealer's got it people actually tell these stories absolutely so i've now got 30 wraps on me. Okay. And, all right, we'll go to the next level in a minute. I've got 30 Uh in my man bag. Standard. Standard. (laughs) So I I try to give the whole image. fucking man bag, I tell you. That (laughs) man bag, it pisses me off. (laughs) The man bag, we've got the wraps in there. So what's going to happen to me now? Okay, so like I was saying, the the bigger the quantity and and the, the form of the drugs, you're essentially, you're risking a possession with intent to supply class B drugs. And will I be treated differently if I was a woman? I think you'd still be arrested, taken to the station, interviewed. They'd probably not handle you in a rough way. Okay. But I genuinely tend to find, if you're being arrested, and I know some people might disagree with me, but if if you know that there's, if you're happy... I wouldn't say happy, but if you know that there's a reason for your arrest, you're kind of clued up. You know what's happening. Yeah. Just roll with it. 
Okay. What, no- if, what if the handcuffs are too tight? Can I tell them to? You do- can just tell them. But a lot of the time, the officers say, well, you're not resisting. I'm quite happy with you. I'm just going to put you like this and then put you in. Put the- me in the back of the car with the handcuffs? No, oh. they'll, but they'll, they'll be very light with you, a light touch. Right. I've okay. seen it happen. Um, but it's when you start being boisterous, mm. all that kind of stuff. And it's the same with a stop and search. I always say with the officers, and I know it may be slightly controversial, but if you just act respectful, because mm. what our mothers always t- teaching us, just because this idiot treats you like that, don't don't bark back. Yeah, yeah. So if you just say, "Officer, I completely understand. I know you, you know you're doing your job, but of course I'm entitled to this search record. Mm. You need to give me the, the why you're searching me and what for and the and the and the law behind it. Or yes, you need to search me or the rest of it. Or yes, you're arresting me." fine, I'm coming with you. Then once you get to the station, get your brief, sort it out. Right. So there's been instances recently that the trade is getting very creative. So it's known now that if you are like a delivery or Uber Eats driver, Mm -hmm. you could have been running your business low key and have your stuff going door to door. But like the police have clocked onto this. Oh yeah, I've had them. You've had them? Yeah, yeah. So how how did they find, how did they know that I'm not delivering chicken and chips? It's all intelligence based. Don't ever get it twisted. There's G's out there. As in police G's? Yeah. There's grasses out there. There's snitches. There's everybody out there. Wow. The people you least suspect, people will tell you X, Y, and Z. Or they may see a particular person who's of interest, who's known before. Right. And they see them, they've got a job and all the rest of it. And they see where they're going. And, they and you know, the local kind of neighborhood officers, they, they'll look at it. But police always have intelligence. They won't tell you what it is, but they always have intelligence. But some of it, I'll be honest with you, some of it's just dumb. I'm being honest with you, just dumb. So you're doing your side hustle, whatever it is. What's the first thing you do? Just act straight. Right. Don't do stupid shit. Yeah, yeah. But what you find is driving that insurance. Driving too fast. Right. Going around the corner. Because officers will always tell you most of the most serious offences they pick up is because they routinely pick them up for something trivial. Right. And then they get nabbed. Yeah. They're stupid, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Because when I heard about this, I thought, oh, that's ingenious. Like, I wouldn't have thought because you can go door to door. Yeah. But obviously, I'm not promoting it. But I'm just saying that it, the, the craft or these crafts are becoming for me less bait you know back in the day you knew that this guy was the local drug dealer so what about if okay so i'm now in a station and they think that i've inserted some things into my rectum mm-hmm. what right do they have to make me bend over so that become so what you have is you have two levels of searches you have uh, a non-intimate search which is just like non-intimate <laughs> which is just like, no foreplay no none of that <laughs> Just like clothing, um, that sort of thing. Um, right. Look under the clothing. Of course, it has to be the same sex because um, they can't do a strip search. So you've got a search which <coughs> happens outside on the road, which they can do in the back of, uh, not in the back of a police van. Sometimes they can do it in the back of a police van if it allows, so. if it allows it. But then you have a strip search, which is again non intimate. It's just like kind of looking around. Obviously, strip search says strip, but then obviously if they think that it's inside. Then they have to go to non-intimate. So they can't actually look in there. They can tell you to squat, but they can't look inside. So what they usually tend to do is they refer you to hospital. So how do you mean? They refer you to hospital for an x-ray. Oh, so you get taken. And then they ask the doctor. To have a look in your bowels. Well, no, they just they just x-ray it so you'll be able to see whether it's there. I've had, on occasion, so, some doctors have had to obviously look inside because ultimately it's it's a two-way thing. Not only is it because potentially a criminal offence, but also because for their own health and safety. Yeah, because if it bursts, isn't it? Yeah, because ordinarily what you find there is you won't find people doing cannabis up the, up the rectum. Why? It'll be you class. Carry more. Yeah, no, it'll be class A. That's when they hide them, and that if it ruptures, game over. You die. Yeah, absolutely. For real. Yeah, I mean, not everybody, but you can imagine having heroin or crack cocaine. I couldn't even imagine putting it up there in the first place. Like, well, I don't know. It depends on your preference, isn't it? This is what I'm <laughs> saying because that's a bit, that's intimate, isn't it? <laughs> but yes, yeah, so if you go to the station and they suspect it, no, what they do is it, it gets more than that. So before that, I I I I failed to mention what they do is they they will detain you and they'll go to the magistrate's court and get uh, an extension to your detention. 
and what they will what they will say is they won't let you go until you've had two clear bowel movements. So they'll leave you there so you can have but two shits. The toilet's shits. not clear; it's metal. I know, but they'll leave you there until you have two shits. But how how are you gonna see that? Oh, that you're on constant watch. So when you're done poo poos, yeah, someone comes and injects it. Yeah, yeah. Nah, you're having a laugh. Whose job is that? Well, some poor police officer <laughs> who gets had allocated. Oh, I'm on poo watch today. <laughs> well, yeah, absolutely. They leave the door open. They're there, or they've got the cameras because they each cell has a camera. So they, they you, you know, you have a look at it, and they just. I am dumbfounded. Who knew? I don't know why people just don't go to JD and work. Like I would have no time for any of this. My heart can't take this kind of pressure. I couldn't be like, in a position where it ruptures in me. Or I'm stopped, and then somebody's got their bits and pieces in me. Mm-hmm. Well, the problem the problem that we have recently um, is, and this comes from stuff like Top Boy, yeah. is they got the kids working. Yeah, because you know I'm about that life. I've worked in a field where trap houses are becoming something that we can't control because the the pull factor, what we call it in social care, for example, is a pull and pull 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 and push factor. Mm. So there are more things pushing you out there than pulling you into your home because your mum can't provide you always with the trainers that you want mm. or the tracksuit. A night tracksuit is like one fifty, you know. Remember our day? I swear it was like forty pound. I don't know, man. I don't know where you're shopping. It's, it's like one fifty. Sports Direct do a nice night tracksuit for fifty quid. It's not that type that they like. <laughs> no, they don't like the fleece one. What's wrong with you? Oh my God, you're so Asian. Like I just can't understand. <laughs> that. Oh my gosh, they don't wear that one. So, sorry, I don't need me to interrupt you. But the thing is, the reason why I raised that is not because of choice. These kids are being made to do it, yeah. and so there's something the grooming, right? Yeah. So there's something now called the uh, called an NRM, yeah. National Referral Mechanism. Mechanism. And we've had countless cases where the the NCA, National Crime Agency, are asked to look into this. And they come back with positive grounds to say, yeah, this kid, we've looked into it, we've investigated it. It looks like he's been he's been used. Yeah. It's called modern day slavery. Yeah. And the prosecution dropped the case. But the thing is, your lawyer needs to know to look for that. But also, working in that field, one of the tragic things are that the leaders of these associations that are encouraging people know that when you have a child, it is likely that they will have a positive NRM and they'll get off with it. Mm. But the problem is when they lose the goods, the debt that they accrue. So we've got young people on the train going up and down doing county lines. County lines. And then they get arrested and all the, f- I was going to say food, all the, uh, <laughs> the drugs <laughs> get taken off them. It's all right. I think the audience know what we're yeah, talking about. Yeah, they know about. what we're talking about. And they owe the chain of command that money, Absolutely. even though the feds have taken it. Yeah. And so then they have to either work doubly hard or steal or... The problem is, is that you know, that's a routine ground that's raised by the prosecution when they want to remind you into custody. What? They'll say, well, th- this guy's lost this amount of drugs because we've seized it, so he's going to have a drug debt. So they'll put him inside. And they use it for your own protection. It's a ground that they, they, they use in court. I've heard it many, many times. So if I'm a mum and I've got a son, I think... So I was watching something on Instagram the other day, right? This mum found this box of money. I don't know if you saw it. I saw it. And she threw all <laughs> the she money... she threw all the 50 pounds from the, from the rooftop. And in the comments, because you know I love the comments, the comments on Instagram comments are, the, are week, the best. If yeah. The comments are the best. Somebody said, made a right query and said, do you know that that might have caused your son his life? Yeah, absolutely. What is a mother to do, though? But the thing is, I was watching that video and... Because she doesn't want her son to have the uh, drug money. And she is she is one of those... Well, I think she sounded like an African mother. Yeah, she... And she wasn't ramping. She was not ramping she, at all. She, she was like, you're going to get and I'm rebuke this money out of the house. But the son... Yeah, she doesn't know what the circumstances are. Like, whether that's money that he's just earned, which he needs to pay someone back or whether it's his own operation, or whether there's something else going on. But importantly, going back to the NRM, I think it's really important that people are looking at this, because a lot of the time it's ignored or confused, or people just don't know to look for it. Because ultimately, and this is where it happens, and this is not self-promotion at all, but it depends on who's talking to you. Because a lot of these kids won't open up. Yeah. They won't tell you. So you're looking even at your solicitor, even as a solicitor, as a solicitor, they won't tell you. So you're looking at that. You're looking at the papers and you're like, something's not adding up here. Mm. 
And then you're asking, it's like, look, are you doing this for money? Or are you doing this because someone has made you? Or is there something else here? And then all of a sudden, if they if you build up a relationship with the kid, they start opening up to you what they tell you. But then it's also important to engage with all the other agencies who are involved because a lot of these kids, they usually have social services involved. Yeah. They usually have a key worker involved. So if you start talking to them, you start building up a picture of this young person. Then all of a sudden you realise there's something else in here. And then you go in there. Ultimately, because if you don't look at that and the kid pleads guilty, ends up with a conviction. A lot of the time in the youth court, you don't go to prison because that's not the way the law in this country is, mm -hmm. especially for, for kids, is to try to rehabilitate and try to make sure that they're doing something different. Of course, there's circumstances where people do go to prison. Yeah. But it's important that people look at these. But do you find, Leah, that, and I've visited many, that young offenders is a rehabilitation or a curse? I don't think young offenders is a rehabilitation at all. So why are we choosing it? Why, why year after year, are we sending young people to young well, offenders? This is, well, the thing is, is, there's a lot of us who advocate for this. But when you go to these places, like Felton, it is a madhouse. And they learn from each other, you know? Yeah, of course they do. So you come out even more skilled but than part, you went in. I know, but part of the uh, part of what we say to any judge, and th the problem is, is sometimes these, these judges and these magistrates, they, they hear the same thing over and over again. They come as deep, they, there's a concept of becoming desensitised. And also, they're not from the streets. My my grey-haired Donny, who lives in Hampshire, he's never lived this life, so he doesn't it, understand Well, that's the another, another criticism that's come. When you look at the judiciary, whether it's the magistrates, whether it's judges... That there's not, it doesn't represent the community, mm -hmm. and they don't understand. Don't get me wrong; there are judges, and there's particular judges I will happily name, not for today, but look at, and then you want that judge in front of you because she, he or she understands mm -hmm. and is willing to, to to look at look beyond what's there. But what I was saying is, Feltham, they're horrible places. Now, what we you routinely say was like, look, this person has never been, this kid's never been to been to prison before but you're going to send them to prison with people who are more entrenched within the criminal right. justice system so all they're going to do is they're going to come out in a worse way right i don't i can't see and i don't no accept reform. i don't accept it from anybody to say they're going to reform unless they move to somewhere else but what people clients have told me you get more trouble in a young offenders institution than you do in an adult man, big man's prison really in an adult's prison people are just doing their own thing right people are there for different things they're just trying to do their time and, and get out. They just kind of keep themselves to themselves. The youngsters, which is what we see replicated on the streets, it's all about clout. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. about rep. It's all about postcodes. You know, all that kind of stuff. So they take that and they regurgitate it within the prison system. They're like, oh, what ends you from? And all of a sudden you start seeing people get shanked, you know, they, you know, make do ones, toothbrushes, you whatever. Know, I've always wondered, how do so many mobile phones end up in prison? Oh, don't be naive. <laughs> okay. But maybe I've got an audience that have no idea, not from Brixton like I am. So can you tell us how phones, because I'm seeing Snapchat videos of man in a, in a grey, and they, that's an iPhone, fam. Like that's a, or an Android. That's not a little brick phone. I'm, I mean, I'm not too sure about the, I mean, most of the phones that are, that are circulated in prison are usually those little small burner phones. How are they making videos? Come on, they got Instagram No, no, no I, got, I got you, I got you. But most of the time it's there because what they do again, going back to our old topic, our old friend, the rectum, they put them up there and they bring them in. But... but who's bringing them in? Prison guards, visitors, Jeez. inmates who are coming in who've been out and then come back in. I'm not being funny. How do I fit a phone up my rectum? Oh, it's possible. I'm not suggesting you go and try <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> no, it's certainly there, but there's. And if you're found with a phone in prison, what I'll give happens? you. I give you a p p before I say that. Before, classic example: there was uh, a certain prison in North London, and they end up getting into lots of difficulty. I think somebody end up. I'm pretty sure he was murdered, and the reason why it was for a particular space within the prison, a particular area, mm. because that's the way things were coming in. Right. And because they wanted that space and they got into to argument and beef with each other, they, somebody ended up getting stabbed and somebody ended up dying. But don't ever, don't ever be naive enough to think that there aren't people on the payroll bringing it in. There's always some way to bring it in. Mental. And if I'm caught with a phone? So they can deal with it in two ways. If you're on a sentence, they could deal with it by adjudication within the prison. So add potentially take away privileges, give you a suspended sentence or add 28 days to the end of your your sentence or like they do now 
they can charge you again and send you to court. Mental. So you're already in prison and then you go to court and they give you a, another conviction and another sentence. Wowzers. What about, um, I know a lot of young people that have been charged with joint enterprise. Mm-hmm. What legally is joint enterprise? So joint enterprise is, is very difficult. I mean, we could do a whole session on this. <laughs> um, but if you're kind of boiling it down to kind of the bare basics, before what used to happen is you and me, we go in. I've said to you that we're going to, I'm going to, we're going to burgle this shop or whatever it is. Mm. Then all of a sudden, I pull out a knife, I stab someone, and you have no idea about it. But because we've gone in together, joint enterprise in the old way would mean we're both guilty of the offence. They'll convict you as well. Right. So I'm convicted for, what, the murder? Yeah. No, but I didn't have the knife. I know. But they changed it recently, which is why, why people got really excited about this. But it's not as great as people make out. Because right now, then it's, it's all about foresight. So you actually have to have some foresight that that's going to happen. So if you didn't know about it, Mm. then you might not be guilty of murder, you might be guilty of manslaughter. Or you might be, yeah, so you might be guilty of manslaughter rather than the murder. So you didn't have any foresight. For example, you go to do, a classic example recently, people went to do a drug deal. My client doesn't know that anybody's got a knife. They just think it's going to be, you know, a bit of arms or whatever. Mm. But someone takes out a knife and stabs somebody. So I had no foresight that this was going to happen. So I could, if I'm with a friend... And we've gone, I've gone to represent my brethren, innit? Like, you're disrespecting my man. Mm. Let's go down and sort him out. I don't intend to kill him, though. I intend to give him a little one-two. But he dies. I didn't even punch him. You punched him. Mm. So you're telling me that me and you are going to do the same sentence? So what you're saying is slightly different. So you're going to... So the first the, the test for murder. The test for murder is that you either intended to, to kill... Or you intended to cause serious harm. Right. Now, if you've obviously gone in there for a punch-up, you're not intended to cause serious harm. Mm. If you've gone in there, you know, dap it up with a weapon, then you and him are both going to go down if you've both gone with weapons. Because mm. the jury would infer that you both were intended to cause serious harm. Even I told them that I always walk with a shank. Well, I don't think you should be telling <laughs> anybody that, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> anybody listening, don't ever say that. <laughs> This is why I can't be a criminal. Because <laughs> I would be that canary that would be talking until you get here. And they would actually have me up because they would be asking me sly things and I will just start talking to business. So what is an IPP? Oh, IPP is, forgive my French, but it's one of the most biggest fuckeries ever <laughs> within our criminal justice system. So it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. But what happened is people got, people, people put an IPP would get a determinate sentence. I'll give you an example. So somebody goes in for burglary, but because they're dangerous and whatever, they'll be given an IPP sentence. So they're given a term of imprisonment. So say two years. Right. So you think, all right, cool. I'll do half or two thirds of that sentence and I'll be released. Nah. You have to be released by the parole board. Right. You have people who went in for a very trivial offence and now serving 10 years, 15 years. What for? Because the IPP doesn't allow them to be released. Because they have to persuade someone that they that, to release them. Even though the judge says I'm serving X amount of years. No, the judge says he's your determinate bit. Right. Two years, but you're pr- this is an IPP sentence. So people are still in prison now where people have committed offences after them, more serious than them, and they've served their sentence and come out and other people are still in. It's one of the worst pieces of legislation ever to be so, put so, through. So by wait, wait. By the, in layman's, country. I've committed a crime robbery. Yeah. And I've been given a four-year sentence. Yes. Yeah. You've been reading the sentencing guidelines. No, is it for you though? It's about four years. <laughs> and in the UK, you serve half. Yeah. So I'm only doing two years. Yeah. So it depends. Sometimes it's half. Sometimes it's two thirds. Dep- why? Well, why is the difference? So sometimes it, it, depending on the type of offence it is, depending on whether you're found dangerous, or oh. there's other factors involved. But it's usually half. Sometimes it's two thirds. So what? What my first question is: Why not just give me the two years if I want to do the two years? So yeah. Why say four years and then it's half? Because you've served the two years in the community. Ah, You're still on license. Right, right. So with the IPP now, I've done my two years. Then I go in front of a parole board mm-hmm. and they say, don't look like, don't like the look of your face. Yeah. And then what happens? I can't go home. No, you just carry on. Okay, but Johnny, cellmate, 
He went through to the parole board, a different parole board, and he got let out, and we did the same crime. That's discrimination. Of course it is. Everybody recognised it, which is why it was repealed. So now there's no IPP. You know, IPP stopped a long time ago. Yeah. But the problem is, is those people who were sentenced to the IPP at that time... Still. They're still rotting in prison. No way. Not all of them. But yeah, one of the worst pieces of legislation. Can you not appeal it? Well, the thing is, if you haven't appealed the sentence then, then you're out of time. So you can't... Oh, yeah. This is a whole... Okay, all right. So I'm a female now. And we're going to move on to women who have been victims of crime. Okay. You know, I was talking to you about women that have been harmed in relationships, for example. Yeah. yeah? And and I was asking because there is a big campaign at the moment about women needing to be protected in our community. And the government is supposed to be doing more. What is that all about? Because shouldn't we just be be protecting full stop? No. The issue of protection, I mean, firstly, yeah, absolutely. There's all these issues going around. I mean, firstly, as a man, I'm just like, dudes, just lay the fuck away. Right. Just if the girl says no, leave her alone. If she's out at night, cross the other road, cross the other side of the road, let her walk past because you don't know what she's thinking. Exactly. You just think my sister, my mom, whatever. Just think about it in that way. So I think as men, we could be, we should be doing more kind of more on on a social kind of forum. But in terms of the law, the problem with domestics is that a lot of crime is unreported. Mm. So you're in a relationship, but you don't want your baby father to be arrested for it because it might have some impact on the child. Right. Or you might have some stupid notion of love, mm. what, whatever it is. But, you know, relationships are complicated. You know, you, you could be having a whole conversation about this. Mm. But in any event, when you leave it out that like, like that. So there are different things that you can be using. If you are genuinely a victim of crime, because the other thing is, and I and I say, I, I put this out just to make it, equal there's a lot of people who lie right i've seen a lot of people like women yeah and And, men and say that this happened to them and didn't happen to them yeah a classic example i've got at the moment where she's alleging something happened and there's no way that could have happened i've looked at the evidence and there's no way it could have happened because she's talking about something that happened before and i've seen the evidence of what she's alleging on this particular occasion from another occasion so it just didn't happen but But it didn't happen then but it happened no, no an incident happened Oh, okay. But she was just this couple where she was ra- she went raggle on this guy's ass. <laughs> <laughs> but in any event, so there's a that which and it's the same way with rape. You have you have people who make false allegations and that just puts off the people who are genuinely yeah. face this and need to come forward. There's always the conjecture and the kind of the repercussions and the shame and all that kind of stuff. It where, where it, it, it affects the way people people think. But le- but those are the fa- real factors that people need to consider. But if you've been a, a victim, a genuine victim, there, there are avenues for it. But the thing is, you need to report it. You can't yeah. go anywhere without reporting it. Like the receipt. You yeah. need a receipt. You need, you need to, listen, even if you report it and you don't make a statement. But culturally, reporting does not occur. It's just not what... You know, like Asian communities, for example, I've worked in some boroughs where it's just not the done thing. You do not speak out of your family network no absolutely maybe, and, I, and i know and i hear be, that um what's the thing called now you know when you're being something violent when you are on a uh, killing on a killing that's it yeah all of that mm. uh, what's on a killing so on a killing is basically a, perce- a perception i mean it's very much prevalent within the asian community where you go outside and you put shame on the family because you married, I don't know, maybe you married a white man or a black man. so Or you married someone out, outside of your community. You might so be you're going to kill me for that? Yeah, so the, the the family decide to take their own action because they've been shamed. So because of their honour, they kill you. Mental. So you find that a lot now. It still happens. Because people, we have intercultural relationships on telly. No, but it still happens. still it, happens. It's a real thing now. You can have... Sex with whoever you want. <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> like, yeah, you know the, the the apps make that possible. So this yeah, is what I'm saying. <laughs> but it, it still happens. It still happens. But what going on? What you were saying? There are things open to everybody, and the police have been given certain certain powers to try to do things. So let's take the instance where you firstly number one make the allegation, even if it doesn't come to anything. There's not enough evidence to prosecute, or it for some reason you don't want to make a statement. You just had him arrested, blew him out of the house. But then you're obviously faced with a concept of, you know, what's going to happen after that. So the first thing the police have, the police have a power 
uh, to impose or make an application for something called a domestic violence DV, protection order, DVPO. Right. They can make an application before the court for up to a 28-day period for that person not to contact you and not to go to your address. So certain conditions can apply. And it doesn't have to be male and, wi- male and female no, no, relationship. No, no, either way. Anything domestic, i.e. sisters fighting, Absolutely. brothers fighting, any yeah, domestic. Yeah, domestic. So some people think domestic violence is man and woman. doesn't yeah, have to it, be Yeah, that. it could be parents. Right. Okay. So there's a defi- they're, they're, they do do a definition of, of domestic and, and it includes all of those, those factors. They can make that on application. So they could say, well, he's not any subject to any conditions. This is what's happened. But again, the police are at fault as well because they start using these things just because man and woman had an argument about money. Mm. There's nothing wrong with them. Yeah. It's not supposed to be used for that purpose. Yeah. But it's used. But what they can do is the police can make an application and they can get up to a 20-day period. And the thing is, it doesn't need your consent. So say you and me in a relationship. Something happens. You think, oh, I don't really want to provide a statement or whatever. But the police are concerned that there might be something else here. They can make an application for me not to go back to the address, for me not to contact you for a 28-day period so you can have some headspace to think about mm-hmm. it, maybe get some advice and decide what you want to do. But, of course, any application has to be reasonable. You have to tie it up. Let's like say, for example, if, if, you're, if I'm working in the area and I've got nowhere to live, they can't, you can't put you out on the streets for it. But what if we're not in a relationship? So, for example, I'm working somewhere and I, I feel like this man is always at the bus stop when I'm at the bus stop and he's looking at me inappropriately. And I just feel like he's a bit creepy. What can I do to protect myself? So then you've got, so for that, I mean, anytime you're, I would, what I would suggest, I mean, as a defense lawyer, because we see, see it in court, we can see what that person should have done or what should have happened. Mm. So don't ever be afraid to call the police. But they take long, you know. I, I, I get that. They take 45 minutes. I get how that. my bus has come. No, no, I get that. I get that. But what <laughs> like, I'm saying you, to, And because <laughs> you're telling me call the police, but also you're making me wait with the man. Yeah, but generically speaking, unless I'm, uh, so generally speaking, if, unless I'm giving you, and I'm never going <laughs> to see this on an open mic about what you should be doing <laughs> to these people. Um, <laughs> what I would suggest, uh, what I would recommend is that you call the police and say, look, you're in danger. You know, this is what it is. This is what's happening. So if someone is genuinely harassing you, like you, there are offenses. So stalking is an offense. Harassment is an offense. Do I need receipts? Do I need evidence? Do I need footage of you? following me for that you always need evidence because if how they're can charged, i do that if i know that you're just i have the gut feeling that you are following me around and everywhere i see you you are how can i so your statement can sometimes be enough okay okay your statement can be enough but what you got to realize is that prosecution going back to dv the crown prosecution service have a they won't ever say this to you but their policy for domestic violence is prosecute everything really yeah they take it really seriously the wow. police do a risk assessment straight off and it, for it to be disposed outside of court is rare. Wow. It will always go through the court system. But then what you also have, so I'll go back to your person at the bus stop, but what you also have after the DVPO is you can take a non-molest- a non-molestation order out. Right. Now, it's nothing to do with molesting before you start. <laughs> <laughs> so Don't molest me order. Yeah. So what that is, is a civil application. Right. And now, I, as a woman, can apply for it on my own. Yeah. There are organisations, okay. um, quite a few. Is good- it expensive though? No, no, no. They, these organizations they help you, help you, help For you, do, help you do the application. Oh, okay. it, it's not expensive, but you can go to a civil court to make an application, and it will have conditions like not non-contact, don't go to the address. It has to be made by affidavit, so you have to do a statement and outline what's happening. It has to go before a judge. But there is that option now. If you breach a non-molestation order, it's a criminal offence, and breach of criminal breach of court orders are taken very, very seriously. If it's a deliberate breach, you can go to prison for up to like two years. Serious. Yes. Yeah. Then what you but that's if there's nothing within the criminal courts. Now, if you go to court, regardless of whether the person's found guilty or not guilty, and there could be many reasons why that happens. The Crown Prosecution Service can apply for a restraining order, even on acquittal. So even if you're acquitted, they can make an application for a restraining order on your behalf. What's acquitted? So I'm not found guilty. Not guilty. Yeah. So even if, I, if the person's found not guilty... You can still make a restraining order. And and the restrain- what grounds? Because the person was found not guilty. No, but there's still obviously a fear there. There's still obviously something that's happened between the parties. So it may not amount to a criminal offence, but they can still make the application. So if I'm a woman and I feel harassed and I take up self-defence, I take up martial arts, karate, whatever. Yeah. And I I, I defend myself. Yeah. But in that defence, the man or woman gets harmed. Mm. Can I go to prison? Only unless the self-defence... Um, 
is not reasonable. But if I'm a black belt, so here's let me I'll give work you my way up now. Yeah, yeah. Let me give you an example. <laughs> so the best time is it's always examples with these cases. So you can always use and it's all about the person and what you're thinking. So the first thing is you can actually preemptive strike is something it exists. So if you're if I'm coming up to you and you genuinely feel that I'm going to do something because of my behavior and all the rest of it, you can have a preemptive strike to strike me to hit me. Right. To put me down. With a, with my bag? Whatever with you've my got. Shoe? With whatever you've got. Isn't that an implement? Is that- no, but the thing is, it, it all depends on the circumstances. So if I'm, a, for example, if I'm a male, I'm significantly bigger than you. It yeah. looks like I'm I'm high on something. And you're, you know, you feel that vulnerable in that situation. You think a slap's not going to do enough, be enough to stop this guy from coming towards me. You can use whatever you think is reasonable in the circumstances. Right. And a, a jury or a magistrate will look at what's reasonable in the circumstances. It, where you get into trouble is you hit him down. Now he's on the floor and then you start booting him in the head. <laughs> But sometimes it takes excessive. Over. That's called excessive self defense. But, but then can't I like call that like a crime of passion? No, that's a different thing. Or is that American? No. <laughs> there is. There's no crimes of passion. There is a. There is a. There is there a. Ca- there, there is crimes. There, of there is a case of uh, called battered woman syndrome. <gasps> in DV. Did you see that thing the other day? Yeah. Oh my gosh! Do you think the lady? On, what we're talking about, right? Is on Instagram. There was a lady that got arrested. You can see her being ch- like handcuffed for stabbing her hu- her husband, and she. Some people said she wasn't remorseful because she was saying, "I wanted him to be dead, basically, and I wanted to kill him, wanted to harm him." And I felt for her, and maybe that was because I'm. A, did you feel for her? Because I felt. For I her mean, I, I I definitely felt that there was there was there was more there. There was a story there to be There's told. A story there. She mm. was either she has been. And that's when you said battered woman syndrome. I'm thinking that must be that. You know when you've been harmed so much that you've actually just lost the plot. Well, there is there is a there's a valid defense in this country. Really, it's called it's, and it's, it's recognized as battered woman syndrome. There's a Indian lady case of I can't I forget the pronunciation. Alu Alu I can't pronounce it, but it's where she's been abused again and again and again and again and again, and then she ends up stabbing the guy. Her husband and killing him, but that's been established as as a defense. Did she go to jail? No. Wow. She must have a good solicitor, though, isn't it? Well, th- it was groundbreaking at the time. It wasn't recognized. Wow. So it will be interesting to follow this case to see whether this woman. Is but it's in America, isn't it? I thought no, she was here. Is it? I thought it was here. No, yeah. But the thing is, but that's but that's the thing is that sounds more like premeditation to me. I'll be honest. No, but she's she's there saying he deserved to. Yeah, but battered. If you're a battered woman, that's premeditation as well, because you must. I know, but a lot of the thing is there's hallmarks. So there's a psychiatrist would look at it and then mm. they're able to analyze it. So a lot of the time, it's not that you want to, but you get into such a fit of a ra- fit of rage at the time because of all of this trauma that you face mm. that it happens. But when you're coming out of it and just saying, "Yeah, he got what he deserved," <laughs> she. But she seemed like vacant, you know, like removed from the situation maybe because i'm a woman well there might be some mental health issues there who knows this is it and i don't know because my girls we were like i can't even say what we were like in the group chat <laughs> the group chat was popping off and it was very interesting the position and i thought oh if this was a man would we say some of the things that no you wouldn't probably I'll be, not i'll be you honest know? with you, you wouldn't if that was a man saying oh yeah she deserved this and all the rest of it people would have no sympathy yeah. whatsoever do you find many male domestic violence victims i've had a few Really, I've had a few, and they're there. Was it physical or emotional abuse? Both, mm. both. It's usually it's usually both. It starts with emotional, and then it becomes aggressive and violent. And do you think they don't come forward because of the masculinity thing? One hundred percent. They don't come across. They they won't come come forward with it simply because people because of the society we live in. Be like, man, the fuck up, right? Because that's what happens, and it's not fair. So as we wrap up, I love what you've been doing on Instagram. So you've been given. A uh, few minutes on Instagram to showcase how people can help themselves in sticky situations. What sticky situation have you found you've got the most responses for? You know what the issue is? People people get themselves into ridiculous situations. So it's not even like the big stuff. It's not even drugs or violence or whatever. Self defense is a is a big one. Mm. But like no insurance. <laughs> Like simple things like that. Simple things like that. But money's tight, you know. You know, but the thing is, is I'll give you an example. When you get a notification, so you pick up a ticket. Yeah. And so somebody says, and so they write to you and say, Cam, well, you know, this is the notification. Please, can you tell us who was driving at the time? 
And it says, Resp- respond within 28 days, otherwise it's criminal offence. People don't respond to it. And then they ask me, oh, uh, you know, what should I do? Respond, respond to the fucker. <laughs> In 28 days. It's fucking days. simple, isn't it? <laughs> and then they say, they said, oh, but I did respond. I was like, when you responded, did you send it recorded delivery? Oh. Back yourself up. Yeah, this, is, this is the police you're dealing with. Back yourself up. And give the details. The thing is, it's so ridiculous because even if it's you, right, you're just thinking to yourself, oh, well, I did it. Why do I need to, why do I need to fill this out? You do need to fill it out because then they drop the speeding offence, which you're probably going to get three points for. Mm. And then they do you for failure to, um, to, to failure for no, failure of notification. And then you get six points. Oh, seriously, you should just nip it in the bud. It's like almost getting a parking ticket at £60 and then... Yeah, and leaving it and not doing it, and then it's 120 And I know certain people that think they can write letters. Yeah. And, um... <laughs> Listen, I know people who are good at that. They they make their, their life from just... They get kicks out of it. But. Let me know their details, because I've got a few... <laughs> Anyway, it has been the biggest pleasure having you on this. Thank you very much for having me. I know we're going to have demands for you to come back and areas. And I know you will be back because I always bully you into what I need, you know. But please do go and follow The Brown Lawyer on Instagram. As I said, there is some imperative information to keep yourself safe in the community. And this is your defence, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. But just bear with me. It's just started. So there will be more content up quite soon content baby i want a youtube channel you know it's a full-time job though god <laughs> you gotta love socials it's been a pleasure thank you guys